Welcome to the Fitter and Feisty Kona Daily News Show powered by Wahoo. I'm Sarah Gross from Live Feisty Media. And I'm Bevan McKinnon from Fitter Coaching. So about a year ago, Bevan, we sat down, we thought there's something missing in the Kona coverage. We sat down in the Wadi Inc. after party and all great ideas are formed at an after party. Obviously. Not all of them come to fruition, but a year later, we're here with the Fitter and Feisty. Yeah, but luckily for our audience, this one came together. And we're here with the Fitter and Feisty Kona Daily News Show. Yes, so we are here in Kona on the big island in Hawaii. At, at the Wadi Inc. House. At the Ironman World Championships. Yes. And we're here to bring you a show that will have a bunch of information about what's happening on the ground in Kona, some athlete interviews. And some interviews with industry insiders and industry leaders, all related to the Ironman World Champs. Right, so a lot of exciting things coming up. Bevan, it's race week here on the Big Island, and we couldn't be here without our sponsors like Wahoo, Wadi Inc, Athletica Rewards, and 4i. Now, we've already been around town and got some uh, interviews with some of the leading people. We've been talking to a lot of people. A lot of athletes. Mm -hmm. um, and the general conversation to date is it's really hard to qualify, but actually get to race day um, without an injury, an illness, or some other hiccup along the way? Yeah, I think people, we talk about how hard it is on race day, but I think people sometimes underestimate how hard it is actually to get here to the race in one piece yeah. and ready to go. Absolutely, and now we've had a whole host of stories throughout the year of athletes that their, their struggles, uh, whether it be with race execution, injury, or illness, and one of the biggest stories along the entire year has been that of Sarah True. Yeah, yeah, I thought um, it's really interesting to hear about how her, her and her coach decided uh, that she was going to come and race here after, after the year that she's had where she collapsed, I think, three times? Yeah, so she's actually been through a couple of races that heat stress has really played a major part in. She finally got her qualification at Mont Tremblant this year, um, but I sat down with Sarah earlier on today and found out, you know, how they actually came to the decision once they qualified whether they thought that she'd actually be in the right space to perform in the way that she wanted to here on the Big Island. You know what? I will feel regret if I'm not here. I understand there's a highly, it's a higher likelihood of not performing to my yeah. potential, but I'm willing to take that risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, it's quite a big learning curve in this, in the trajectory of both going into Ironman training but also seeing how quickly you recover from an Ironman. Mm. And that's the, at this stage, a little bit of the unknown for this race? It's it's more than that. So my, my coach's approach is, um, so my coach is Dan Lorang. Yeah. He doesn't like athletes racing a lot. He wants to... <laughs> so, so you push the, push oh, the envelope there. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> no, what's what's funny is that um, like a month ago, he, he said that some coach, somebody had asked him, are you still, are you still coaching Sarah? <laughs> Because this is not this your style. Not your style. Yeah, yeah. This is not your well, plan. how hard was that conversation between you two then? It wasn't. We were we were totally honest. So I I had reflected on it as, you know, this is I understand that I am taking the emotional route, yeah. not the high performance route. Yep. And she's like, as long as you're cognizant of that, it's okay. Okay. You know, we're we're going into this, but we also we also realized that, um, you know, I. I felt like full transparency, full honesty between us was only where we're going to come here. Yeah. And that meant checking in every single week uh, between Mont and Mont and now and being like, does it still make sense? Yeah. Does it still make sense for me to race? If last week he had said, Sarah, you're out of your mind, I'd be like, you're absolutely right. I will spectate. And that's it for the year. I love Sarah's attitude. I, I really think she she's ready to race from her heart and it sounds like she's really re sort of ready to be here. She's totally ready to be here uh, but I think at the end of the day you've, you've got to remember that in Kona last year she uh, reflected and felt like she had a almost like a hangover um, sort of sensation feeling two weeks after the race uh, in Ironman Kins uh, she passed out just after the halfway point and then in Frankfurt she was pulled from the course with only about 700 metres to go. So there's still that um, cloud that sort of hangs over her head for the second half of the marathon, and she's only going to find out when she gets to race day. How, like, 
nothing, there's nothing that indicates that something seriously wrong. Yeah, is other than, other than having to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone's yeah. out there having to deal. With yeah, it. and and if I black out again, I black out again. You know, it's. I don't want to seem blasé about it. But you're happy to enter the race and start knowing there's a chance? Totally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So in Sarah's case, it's the second time that she's come to the island. She doesn't have a great deal of experience. Marinda Carfrey, on the other hand? Three-time world champion. She's raced here a number of times. She knows what she's getting into. She's coming here for her 10th visit to the island. Wow. So that's the kind of experience that you can't pay for. No, you can't buy. Yeah, and she's also carrying an injury. Yeah, well that would probably be the other injury that everyone's been talking about. She slipped over running at Santa Cruz and she's broken, I think, the radial head in her forearm. Yeah, near her elbow. Yep, um, and she did do the whole last swim and I caught up with her after the event. You know, I don't think so. I think I think once the gun goes off and the adrenaline's going, um, um, I mean, at five weeks post-break, this, this one should be fully healed by um, six weeks. Unless someone, like, grabs me and, like, punches me in the arm, which I hope no one um, <laughs> It is going up. Then, yeah, um, then I should be fine. And, I mean, today, you know, today I was really trying to avoid most of the swimmers. I was a little bit wide, so that I didn't, didn't up it around too much. And, um, yeah, I didn't get knocked today, which was good. But um, I think on race day, if, if it gets knocked around a bit, I mean, again, Race day, you know, it doesn't matter, you just move on. Bevan, I love what Rennie said there. Race day is race day. These women are warriors, right? And you can see it, you can see the, that same attitude that Sarah has, Rennie has. They're bringing it on race day and they're just going to do whatever they can on the day. I know, and I'm standing beside them and they're like five foot four and I don't want to get into a fight with them, even with a broken arm. I think no. I would lose. No, you don't want to get into a fight with Rennie. Yeah, no, I don't actually. No. <laughs> How fast would you have swum? Oh man, uh, I think my fastest swim here was about 57 oh, mine minutes. Was, mine was 50, 60. Ah. <laughs> Simple as that. You just made that up, didn't you? <laughs> you don't even know. Yeah, well, it wasn't as fast as 46. And the boys swam 46 at the front of the race this year. And we were down there to catch up uh, with some of the lead men and some of the lead women when they came out of the water. Josh Amberger won the race last year, mm -hmm. uh, so I caught up with Josh at the finish line. You never know what guys like Jan um, is going to do on race day. Uh, so yeah, we've got potential for a good group. There's always, always potential for guys up front, but yeah, sometimes people go a bit harder in this swim than they do on race day, so you never can really count on, on, it, on something happening here on race day. So you caught up with Josh just there at the Hoala swim, yep. and that was on Sunday morning. And a lot of the pro athletes actually use that swim to help them train for the race the next week, just to have a hard 4K hit out the yep. week before. Um, but someone actually was Lindsay Corbin said to me that every year she comes and she does that swim and she ends up a little bit too tired and beat up because I guess the pro athletes aren't used to starting with so many people around them. Yeah. Um, and so some people gave it a miss. Yeah, and last year I think there were more of the top contenders, both male and female there. I think it's it's a catch-22 for them because for some of the weaker swimmers, it can knock their confidence and they can see the gaps between them and some of their you know contemporaries and maybe there's nothing that you can do if you're five minutes down, uh, one week out from you know Kona. Uh, T.O., I spoke to him after the race, Tim O'Donnell, uh, he swam hard out to the turn and easy on the way back in. Uh, Jocelyn McCauley in previous years has done exactly the same thing. Um, but for some other reason, some athletes uh, don't want to use that race as a good prep event. And I had a chat with Braden Curry, who was third last year, mm -hmm. about why he didn't do the Hoala swim. It's been a difficult financial year for you on the sponsorship side of things. Um, are you looking for more sponsors at the moment? Um. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a uh, tough times in the sport, really. Um, really kind of battle, battled through this year. And, uh, you know, if any more sponsors want to jump on board, um, there's probably some more space somewhere <laughs> you can find. Uh, so, so, yeah, get in there. If you were out there on the swim, um, what kind of drink would you think that you'd be wanting halfway through the swim just to pick you up? Well, you know, if this is like quick fire questions, uh, Red Bull comes to mind. Yeah. Okay. Natural enhancer. Yeah. Um, 
And obviously, uh, yeah, um, Blue 70 gives me a really clear vision um, to get my head through the right space. Yeah. Okay, all right, nice. Um, the swim today, the whole swim, last year you, you crashed to third place. I uh, didn't see you mm. on the start line today. Mm. What, um, what, what, what happened? I think I've had nightmares ever since. <laughs> Let's say I, I put myself out there as a pretty brave person. Like, uh, you know, I've done some stuff in my life that, you know, kind of mountains and cliffs and things that I would say are pretty out there, but uh, I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life as a mass start with like 2,000 people. Um, so I wasn't that keen to jump back in the water today and I'm happy to go for a little swim by myself this afternoon. <laughs> Were you ever scared in open water? Did you ever get like freaked out by open water? No, I'm not. I, I swam with dolphins. The very first time I came here to Kona, yep. I swam out, the, I swam the whole course and at the turnaround, I, dolphins came up beside me. And the big daddy dolphin came to check me out and was like really close. And I had that funny, you know, that funny calm feeling you're supposed to have with dolphins. Yeah. Which like, I'm not that kind of person. Like, I'm not like a touchy Mystical. feel. Yeah, I'm not like, oh, I believe in dolphin juju <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but, like, and you rode it, the mystical that's dolphin. That's right, I did. I grabbed its fin and it took me home. <laughs> no, it was, but I did feel like a sense of calm. Yeah. And I really, I, it was actually an, an amazing experience. I don't, I've never freaked out in the water as well, but the thing about those pro guys and girls is they're starting in small groups where the whole swim is like a thousand people and you can get that fight or flight kick off straight away. Mm -hmm. And I know that Braden last year raced on pure adrenaline alone and so I don't think he could afford to waste that adrenaline uh, before race day, he's got to save it up for it. <laughs> Um, but a lot of people have been forced into the open water here in Kona this week, or if not longer than that, because yes. the pool's been closed. Yes, the pool has been closed, and some people have been more resourceful than others. <laughs> yes, if you're well-connected, well-sponsored, and mm -hmm. possibly one of the most well-known female athletes in the world, Lucy Charles didn't have a problem with the closure of the pool. No, she did not. So I we heard a rumor that Lucy had an endless pool put into her, the place where she stays every year in the same place in Kona. endless pool on the infinity pool <laughs> right. at the beautiful penthouse Well, mansion. don't give it away. <laughs> I had to go check with her myself. So I went up to visit Lucy. So endless pools actually deliver this, installed it, and it's gonna stay here permanently for us. So we have... Whoa. Fast lane. Is it the slow lane? <laughs> well, what's really cool this is, is where I swim. The current goes this way really yeah. fast. You yeah. kind of get a back current that way, so it almost makes that little lazy oh, river. You have a little so. recovery, and yeah. then you do another surf. recovery lap, and then go again. And wow. we even have a mirror on the bottom, so you can watch yourself. And are you doing all your swim training here? Or really um, I've done most of it in here. I've gone and done some key workouts over at the school pool, mm -hmm. um, but most of them been in here because it's really busy over there. Awesome. Well, thanks for showing us. <laughs> You're welcome. So it was really great to go up there, catch up with Lucy, see what she has going on with the endless pool and her and her creative solution for the pool being shut. But not all technology has to be a big thing installed on this on the beautiful side of a of a Hawaiian cliff. Yeah. Um, some technology comes in smaller boxes, and uh, swim technology is, has actually come a long way. Yeah, for a long time we've had everything going on with bikes and running and that swim space is something that prevents, uh, presents a big opportunity for more data. Uh, there's lots of people entering the market and trying to, uh, but I think a lot of people want to know what's going on when they swim. Yeah, so for a long time with our devices we've been able to tell how fast we're going yeah. at any given moment. Poorly. <laughs> Poorly. <laughs> so, uh, I'll add that very poorly. Um, and you, they haven't quite nailed it. A lot of people have tried. Um, but we've got Dan here to tell us a little bit more about yeah. what's happening in that space. Dan Eisenhart, the CEO of Form Swim. Thank you for having me. Dan, tell us a little bit about where swim technology is at in terms of knowing where you're at and how fast you're going. Well, in the past and up until a few months ago when we launched our product, you'd have to rely on either the pace clock up on the pool deck and you'd have to wait until you were resting so you could actually stick your head out of the water and look up and hopefully your goggles weren't too fogged and hopefully nobody was standing in front of the pace clock and you could kind of do some mental math and figure that out. 
Or you may have a watch like this and you'd have to do some of the same stuff. You'd have to kind of press a button. and Like when people do flip turns, like, and they're trying to hit their watch in I've the middle of the flip turn. I've seen that at the pool, yeah. actually. And <laughs> I always like, wonder, what? What, why, what are they trying to achieve? Yeah. I don't even know if they can, but they, some attempt to do it. Yeah. So, so that's obviously not optimal. And so the idea that we came up with this idea to put a, a display into a pair of swim goggles, a smart display. And so you could track your metrics in real time. You know, when you do your, uh, your, your turn, you can see how fast you did your last length. You can see your stroke rate, your pace per hundred. And how do, you, how do you see it? So it's, this is what we call, it's a waveguide that sits in your goggle lens <laughs> and it's see-through. So, and you don't have to change your focus. Yeah. So it's completely immersive. When you want to look at those metrics, you just kind of uh, focus on, on the numbers that are right in front of you and then you can take them in. And so you don't have to stop. You don't have to do any mental math. It's completely offloaded to the goggles. They detect everything automatically, including when you're resting. You don't have to fiddle with a button or anything. The only thing you have to set up is just your pool length before you go in and you press start and off you go. You just set and forget. Yeah. So basically you're swimming and in front of your eyes, you can see how fast you're going at any given time. That's with the, with the form goggles. That's yeah. basically it, along with a number of other metrics right. as well yeah. that will help you improve your technique and your, your speed. I'm gonna have to say I've actually tried the goggles and I was really surprised at your ability to either watch what you're doing with your swimming or change your focus and pick up the metrics quite clearly in the, in the corner of your eye. Uh, and having swim coached for a number of years and seeing the evolution of some of the swim technologies and knowing the first that athletes have for data, uh, I thought it was a, a pretty cool device. Um, where do you see it going? because uh, it's very pool based at the moment uh, do you think it'll ever get into the open water is that something you can say yes or no to i usually don't want to get tricked into saying anything about the sort of future features or product yeah. roadmap or anything but i think it's clear we've we're listening to the customers at the moment so we're already in market and we're seeing pool swimmers love this triathletes yeah. love this competitive swimmers love this fitness swimmers love this because now they can just like again keep track of their lengths and everything else and and it motivates them but uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of open water swimmers, triathletes that are asking us you know, the same question over and over, you know, when are you gonna you know, do something for us? So we're evaluating currently. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping uh, we can come, come back with an answer really soon. But uh, it's definitely clear to us that this is just the beginning, uh, the fact that you can show these metrics in the pool. And that's where we spend most of the time. That's more than 90% of the time for all of us, whether yeah. you're an open water swimmer or not, you get to, you get to swim in the pool. So that's, that was the biggest problem for us to focus on. And then adding other features on top of that is, a, is an incremental change for us. Yeah. We're thinking about sort of the platform for people to get used to these goggles and, and getting used to that uh, experience, that immersive experience. And then little by little come up with, you know, launch features that, that can improve on that experience. Are you ready to race on Saturday? Um, I'd be lying if I said I was ready. Um, I'm doing my best and um, I'll be ready on Saturday. Okay, we're gonna say now, you have to predict your time in all three disciplines because you're racing for the Challenged Athletes Foundation? That is correct, that is yep. correct. Um, so I'm, I'm honored to be part of that family and you know, Bob Babbitt and the crew there have been great, yep. uh, really gracious. Um, so I'll do my best. I'm okay, not... swim time, swim time. You, well, what, I, I what, what did you swim, you were you're not getting out of it. I, I was a competitive swimmer. I was yeah. a distance swimmer back in uh, back in college. So we'll see around the 50 mark probably. Nice. But uh, but if I I did the training swim and I got off course three times, the kayaks had to come pick me up. It was pretty <laughs> embarrassing because I didn't know why they were trying to contact me. They were like, oh, I was like, hey, you know. And uh, and then they all came. There's like three kayaks in front of me, and they got me all, you know. Well, next you need to invent goggles that tell you when how to go in a straight line. So that's, that's your next yeah, project. Yeah, you know what? That that was actually a, a pretty big guy open for me. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing you're going to go back to the creative team and the technology team and say, "Here's something else to add to the list." We're going to look into that for sure. Oh, nice. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us, Dan, and uh, good luck on Saturday. Thank you very much. Thanks, Baby. So the sun is setting on our first episode of the Fitter and Feisty Kona Daily News Show. It's it's been so fun, and it's powered by Wahoo and Wadi Inc and Athletica Rewards. And Four Eye. And tomorrow, we're gonna to come back and meet here. Yeah, and I'll be here. <laughs> and we will talk about bikes. We might have some previous world champions. We might have some potential world champions. Yeah, so should we meet back here at sunset? We should do that. Thanks for watching.